So I'm going to tell you guys a story. The story takes place in Vietnam. One of the most graphic and uh, controversial conflicts that we've had, that we were involved in. So the story starts as two U.S. Marine scout snipers go out on a six-day mission. They pack their things and um, they head out. They go to, they are crashing through the brush and jungles of Vietnam and they come to a rice paddy. Now, I don't know about many of you know like geology or stuff like that, but Vietnam has a lot of rice paddies and a lot of very big ones. So they come to um, with a tree line and they set up their lookout at the edge of the tree line looking over the rice paddy. There's about 500 yards of rice paddy. There is a stream running through it and then there's more rice paddies on the other side. Take note of that, it comes into play later. Now, as they sat, they sat there all day just waiting for something to happen. Towards the evening, 150 Vietnamese shoulders, soldiers begin to cross the rice paddy. And as they begin to make their way across the vast expanse of rice paddies, they're kind of struggling. I don't know, you guys know much about rice paddies, but they're not the best to walk through. <laughs> so uh, these 150 guys get to about that stream. That's about five or 600 yards away from the sniper's position. Now, something you should know is a sniper we're talking about. His name was Carlos Han Hathcock. He was a Marine who was arguably one of the best snipers of the time and is still arguably one of the best snipers of all time. He won multiple competitions shooting bullseyes at 500 and 1,000 yards, yards. His job in the military was to shoot and be a competitive shooter and to teach people how to shoot. So 600 yards, 500 yards for him, no problem. So he allows the enemy soldiers to start going into this stream because they've got a cross to get to where they're going. So they're not putting themselves in an advantageous position at all. So as they are looking at the 150 soldiers, him and his buddy, there's two of them there, they spot three officers. Officers are the people who are in charge and are leading the other 147 men across the rice paddies and doing, you know, their various leadership duties. Well, the snipers, you know, obviously you take out leadership first. So they line up both their shots simultaneously. Two of the officers drop. The third officer panics, which is not a good thing to do. And he decides to try to run in this rice paddy. Well, as we mentioned earlier, they're not easy to get through. So he doesn't make it very far and they get him too. And now another thing to take note of is normally snipers relocate and find a different position after three shots because they don't want to be found or compromised. These guys, they're looking at the uh, enemy soldiers and noticing the other 147 that are still standing are not doing a thing. They're just there and they're chilling out in the middle of the open. Now, this seems weird to us because in the United States military, you're taught to when you lose your leadership positions, the next person takes a step, they go up and they start leading and they start doing something. Well, in other armies, that's not always the case. They are trained to follow orders. They are not trained to deal with problems as they arise. So these other 147 men, they're not trained. They don't know what to do. They're lost. Now they're just sitting ducks. So the two snipers notice this and they continue to pick them off one by one. Now the snipers, eventually these guys figured out they couldn't just stand there. So they hit the dirt and they find some sort of cover, which there isn't much of in a rice paddy. But they find cover, and the snipers keep them pinned down all night long. Now, how did they do that? Well, you know, it gets dark, so the snipers had something called, um, they had them, something called star clusters, which is a type of artillery shell that provides illumination in the dark. So all night long, these guys call in star clusters, and they light up the sky so they can see where these soldiers are at. Well, while the, while the star clusters are being lit up and the enemy thinks that the snipers are still watching them, the snipers decide to relocate in the night, in the cover of night, because why not? It's a good idea. So the uh, snipers relocate, and in the morning, the enemy soldiers, the few of them that were there still, they decide they had to do something, so they try and charge the last position that they were where the snipers were at. Well, again, you can't run through a rice paddy very well, and the snipers are no longer where they were before. So they quickly figure out this was a very bad idea. So they return to their previous spot, and they stay there. The two snipers kept these men pinned down for five days. Five days. Until they ran out of supplies on the sixth day. And they decided that they needed to leave. So 
since they had been calling in artillery with star clusters, they figured the guys in the artillery would have it pretty zoned in by now. And they called an artillery strike. And during the artillery strike, while the rice paddies were being flattened, they left, leaving those 150 men there. Why did I tell you this story? Well, we're not there yet. We got more to cover, so follow me. So turn your Bibles with me to Job 1, verse 1. I won't take your attention to the story of Job, but first, before we continue, or before we can dig out of this story, what I want to dig out, we got to figure out what happened to Job and who he was and all these things. So who was Job? Well, let's read our scripture. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. So from this verse, we initially pick up Job is a pretty stinking good guy. There's not much more you can do, you know, to be any better than he was. So what did Job have? What made him special? You know, what made him different than all the other people at the time besides he was just a good guy? So let's uh, look at verses 2 and 3. Job had seven sons and three daughters born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. So now, back in this time period, money wasn't everything. It was what kind of what you had, and Job had it all. I I am a farmer, and I've worked on a farm, but I cannot imagine trying to tend to all these animals, because there is a lot of them. So now that we know why Job stands out, um, and it also mentions he is one of the greatest people in all the East. So this guy is so much wealth on top of him being such a good person that he's just at a different status level than almost everybody else. And then again, I want to refocus in. Others view Job as one of the greatest people in the face of the East. So all these things, they kind of line up. And since Job follows God, it makes him a really good target for Satan because he's got all these things and God's blessed Job. So let's look at uh, the conversation that uh, Satan and God had that that started to turn Job's life upside down. Let's go to Job 1, 6 through 12. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, and that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? around his household and around all that he has on every side? Have you not blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land? But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan comes into God's presence, and they're having a conversation, and God goes, have you seen Job? That's my guy, you know. He's, he's been so good, and he's been perfect, and, and uh, he's followed me faithfully all the days of his life. And Satan goes, yeah, because of what you've given him. You've given him everything he could have ever asked for. I bet you if you take it away, he'll turn his back on you. So God goes, all right, let's try that. So, at, so as um, we continue forward through the story, let's look at verses 13 to 22. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabines raided them all and killed and took, killed them and took them all away. They indeed have killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. This already seems like the worst day in history for most of us. Losing that kind of stuff, just gone. Verse 16. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Man, when it rains, it pours. I cannot imagine how Job is feeling, and we're not even halfway through yet. While he was still speaking, 
And let's let's take note of how the rapid succession of these events took place while he was still speaking, while he was still speaking. One right after another came to Job and said, you've lost this, you've lost this, and now you've lost this. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them all away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came and across from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on all the young people and they are all dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. So first, Job loses all of his possessions and then top it off, his kids. I'm not a parent and I probably won't be for a while, but I cannot imagine losing one but all of his kids, and he had a lot that he had raised since the day they were born. All gone. Like that. So, Job holds fast to God and does not blame him. And God sees this and continues to brag about Job when Satan comes back to heaven the next time. So let's look at Job 2, 3 through 7. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and he still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that the man has he will give for his life, but stretch your hand out now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he surely will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now that Job has, you know, begun mourning the loss of not only all of his possessions and wealth, but his family and his kids. Now he's got boils on top of it. And I've never had a boil, but from what I've heard, they are by no means a pleasant experience, and he's covered with them from head to toe, not just one, but everywhere. So after Satan is allowed to affect Job's physical health, Job's physical health, even Job's wife turns against him in Job verses, or Job chapter 2, 9 and 10. So let's take a look. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Even when his, the one who was supposed to be by his side and supporting him through everything came to him and told him that he should give up, he still remained faithful to God. And that's something to be taken note of, because I don't think I could do that. Now, next uh, we come to... uh, Job's friends come to visit him, and they sit with him for seven days, because when they see Job, he looks like a totally different person. So they just, they sit down with him, and they sit there for a week, saying not a word. Now, when they, at the end of this seven days, Job opens his mouth, and he kind of complains. Job mourns and asks God why he was born and why he has to endure so much. Let's look at Job 3, verse 26. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. I think that sums up chapter 3 pretty well. He's so exhausted from all the trials he's been facing that he can't, can't rest. He's got so much on his plate that his entire mind and being is just filled with contemplation and sorrow and sadness but he still hasn't turned his back on God. And now as we go continue forward and through the book of Job, we see that Job's friends and Job proceed to have a very lengthy debate about God and why he's experiencing what he's experiencing and why he's suffering. But yet, through all this, Job stood by God's side and defended him nonetheless even though he complains sometimes, which is perfectly understandable given the circumstances he's in. 
God finally comes to Job towards the end of the book, and they have a conversation. And Job talks to God. And they answer all the questions that Job has. And then I, one thing that towards the end of the book that I find very interesting, so we're going to turn to chapter 42 of Job, is that, um, well, let's just read it. Job chapter 42, verses 7 and 8. And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, and that the Lord said to Ephelias, the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you accordingly to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. I don't really know the timeline for how long Job and his friends were talking, but it sounds like a while. And through all of it, Job remained by God's side and stuck up for God, even though he lost everything that he had and all of his kids. He lost it all, and through chapters and chapters of his friends trying to convince him otherwise, that he had been doing something wrong or had made a simple mistake and he just wasn't thinking about it, that he stood by God's side and he said no. And they tried to badmouth God, and he said no. He stood by God's side. Once Job has proven himself to be loyal to God and allowed him to lead fully, trusting in him, God rewards Job with more than Job could ever have imagined. So let's look at Job 42, 12 through 17. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jeremiah and the name of the second Keziah and the name of the third Karen Hapuch. And in all the land there were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. So even after all this adversity and all that he had been through, when he allowed God to lead him through it and stay by his side, no matter how dark it got, God rewarded him. He gave him twice the possessions he had, twice the possessions he'd had before, and gave him ten more children. And Job lived 140 years. It's a long time, especially after what he'd gone through. You would think he would have been about at the end of his wits by the time he'd been through boils and losing it all and his wife turning against him and his friends trying to convince him otherwise. But no, Job was there. Now, why have I told you these two stories? Because one is a representation of following the wrong leaders. 147 men followed three officers to their graves. Why? Because they were not competent leaders. They led them to an open and vulnerable position, and they paid for it. And let's take note. Only it took two people to take out 150. No matter how strong you think you are, when you're not following the right leader, you're going to be led to an open spot, and it's not going to take much to topple your towers. Now, the other is a representation of following the right leader, the only true leader, God. Job allowed God to lead him and trusted him even when the enemy was picking him apart, just as those two snipers were picking 150 apart. And it looked as if his life was over, but in the end, because he stayed true and allowed God to lead, He walked away with more than he ever could have asked for. So I ask you, who are you going to choose as your leader? Someone who will put you in a dangerous situation with no way out and will end in your demise? Or are you going to follow God 
who understands where to lead you and where to put you in the most advantageous positions possible, even when life looks dim. If you choose God to be your leader, he will lead you to more than you could ever ask for, an eternal life and a home with him.